Next up is the second half of the postdoc team that were playing jokes on David. Um, I, it reminded me that uh, in Logan, I remember you'd go in, uh, and I don't know if it was during their postdoc days, but you'd go into David's office, and he had this sort of stick branch sitting next to his desk, and there was this little plastic buzzer next to it. And, you know, I went in there for ages just, you know, I'm not going to say anything. What the heck, this is my major advisor. I don't know this guy. And... I remember finally asking him, I said, what's the deal with this? And he never said anything. He just grinned. It's like, look, it like, was just one reaction out of you. So uh, he had his own little practical joking. I wish I had done the cue key to him. Oh, that was pretty good. Um, next up, we've got another professor emeritus, Dr. Gary White. He received his Bachelor of Science from Iowa State University in fisheries and wildlife biology an MS from the University of Maine in wildlife biology and a PhD from Ohio State in zoology. His involvement with David Anderson also began as a postdoc at Utah State University where he and David o Otis overlapped. At that time they were working as, as uh, uh, Otis uh, alluded to on closed capture recapture models. Um, but as you know that morphed and uh, capture, recapture, open models, and much, much more. Besides his postdoc at Utah State University, he spent many, many years at Los Alamos National Lab as a scientist there, where he worked on small mammals to large ungulates. Nice thing about Los Alamos is it had a lot of money. Uh, I remember David said, oh, you know, I was doing simulations on the new, faster, mini vax mainframe replacing the old burrows at Utah State. But we had to pay 0.01 cents a CPU, which was a lot of money when you're generating all these simulations, which Otis alluded to was exciting, and it was quite good, you know. So Dave said, well, I think it was a conversation. He, Gary White said, come down, and we got a vax, and we got six people on it, and it's free. And instead of getting up at 10 p.m. to start a batch because it was 0.001 cent from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., and running all these simulations, I was able to get done what took me months in a matter of a few days with Gary. You also had to deal with Gary's way of teaching you. Here's an advanced Fortran book. It's like, can you tell me where to go in this damn book? I'm only here for a week. You know, no, he's not going to tell you where to go. He's kinder and gentler now in his old there days. He really is. Uh, Somewhere along the way, he had some projects up in Colorado, working with the Colorado Division of Wildlife, the state agency's name back then, and also some faculty at Colorado State University. And over time, they enticed him to come up and join the faculty at Colorado State University. And that began a long career that ended uh, with his retirement not too long ago. He continues to be very active, and in particular, updating his signature program, MARC. It is a signature program used worldwide by all sorts of folks to, to analyze marked uh, 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 individuals in capture, recapture, open models, closed models, and much, much more. I've heard many a times it, the program referred to as a black box. And for most of us, it is a black box. But I've, I've heard it at meetings in a derogatory way because people, you know, they don't understand what's going on. And you look at them and you go, do you know what happens when you run Excel? You know, I go, you can get the source code, which I had to get for program capture, which he also wrote. And by God, you do not want to go through his code. But you can. 
And so that's the difference between the software that Gary has developed and much of the wildlife software. You actually can, if you want to go figure out what's going on, do that. In addition to his work in quantitative ecology, in particular estimation and modeling of population parameters, he's had an interest in wildlife biology in general and working on all sorts of species. A lot of mammals, but quite a few birds and even a few fish thrown in there as well. He's a recent past president of the Wildlife Society, and among his many awards, two is the Aldo Leopold Award, the highest honor uh, bestowed by the Wildlife Society. In his retirement, he more frequently can be found visiting all sorts of places inside and outside of Colorado, with his, uh, uh, most times with his lifelong partner, Liz, and often in Bigfoot, his RV van, that's internet enabled. I remember one time telling him, I said, oh, I can tell when you know, you've had a bad day hunting because you'll have an early email, you know, 10 a.m. there, and, he, and he's like, no, it's the other way around. If I've had a good day, I'm back at the computer. The dog is happy too, you know. Sadly, Gary and I have one thing in common this summer. We both have new hips. His is only about two weeks old, mine's nine weeks. And unfortunately for him, he's gonna have to loan his dog out in a couple of weeks because the dog is gonna look at him and go, we're not going anywhere. But if, if he keeps doing his exercises and he's moving along, he'll get some late late season hunting out, out here soon. Gary's gonna to talk to us about the process, new methods and software development and workshops. <clears throat> if my hip wasn't sore, I would have kicked Ken off there so I wouldn't have to put up that damage to my reputation. Um, this slide is to show you that we had fun. David and I on many workshops and a lot of times with more than just us, we had fun. Um, this particular one was taken at, in UAE at Abu Dhabi at the Hilton. Uh, and you notice there's only one person there drinking beer. The other person, I'm not sure what's in that glass, but that was always the case. David never did learn how to drink beer with the rest of us. <clears throat> um, so how I first became involved with David was in 1975. I um, got a phone call one day from him. There were some mutual acquaintances <clears throat> that knew of what I was doing at, at The Ohio State University. And, and uh, <clears throat> uh, David phoned up and wanted to know if I was interested in postdoc, and I don't, I don't remember the details of how it actually happened, but anyway, we uh, had a lot of discussion, and one of the things that probably got me the job, <clears throat> the postdoc, was Formac. Now, I'll bet there's only one or two other people in this room that know what Formac is. Nope. No, even you don't know how it is. <laughs> Well, it was a package developed by IBM. It's called Formula Manipulator, Manipulation Compiler. You could take a punch deck of cards, which were equations, uh, in Fortran mode, enter them into the computer, and it would generate the derivatives of those functions. Now, anybody that's ever done any numerical optimi optimization knows that the first thing you, good code has is they have good derivatives, back, especially back in 19... 72, 73, 74. And this thing would actually generate a punch deck of the derivatives. And when I told David that I knew how to do that, I got the job. Because <clears throat> uh, again, he, like the rest of us, most of us in this room, you kind of know what a derivative is and you sort of know that x squared and the derivative of that's 2x and after that, your ability to do derivatives is out the window. <clears throat> so this thing was a powerful little tool. And, and better yet, it was actually written in Fortran. I wish I'd have known that at the time because I'd have got the source code somehow <laughs> if I'd had to steal it. Uh, anyhow, that was number one. Dave Otis talked about the other reason, and it was George Seaver's book. George's book came out in 1973, and uh, anybody that was interested in that field, you had a copy of it, and you started reading, trying to understand what was going on. 
And so again, when he found out that I bought my own copy and I was spending a lot of time trying to understand it, I think that's also why I ended up getting that, <clears throat> that position. It was actually to do an oil shield project, uh, which didn't take long that we were able to figure out how to twist that money around to do capture recapture work. Uh, <clears throat> couple of months. I spent a summer out in the field doing oil shell work or small mammal work but in vegetation sampling, but that was enough. Uh, after that, we said, okay, we're going to make this thing into a capture recapture, and that's how I got involved with the, the whole capture recapture program. Oops. Now, <clears throat> there's another story here. <clears throat> it's a good joke. And again, I was a butt of this one. Uh, <clears throat> We're driving around Utah and Western Colorado, and we had this big old green station wagon that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had, these big old tuna boats, Plymouths. I'm sure some of the older folks here remember those things. They were huge. <clears throat> that's not one that's, that's, it was U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service green, but it, it's the same idea. You get the picture of this big thing. We're cruising down the road one morning east of Vernal, and I'm driving, and I go to pass this car, and I get up right beside it, and David kind of goes, uh, and that's what was on the door of the other car. <clears throat> so like, well, we'll just ease on by here. And I'm thinking, okay, so much for this postdoc. I'm going to be looking for another one. But it worked out. He didn't stop. It's like maybe he saw the federal plates. I don't know. Uh, one of those lucky days. <clears throat> the other thing on that trip I found out about was what breakfast is for David. <clears throat> we stopped. Well, I mean, I, you know, we were in a hotel, and I got up and had breakfast, and boy, this thing is kind of wild up here, you know that? Um, I thought it was just Ken, but it is flaky. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, David stops for breakfast, and this is what he came back with, a bottle of orange crush and a candy bar. And of course, you all know he likes chocolate, because that's why that back table's full of chocolate. But... Um, what I found out over the years of going out on work, doing workshops with him, that his idea of a breakfast buffet was that. <laughs> that was, boy, that was as good as it gets. <clears throat> now, let's get down to more serious stuff. Uh, when I came to CSU in 1984, I'm, I'm going to jump over the capture, recapture Utah days because <clears throat> in my days in Los Alamos when we were working back and forth, and we did, we did still continue to do a lot of work back and forth. But uh, <clears throat> we both arrived here in August, August of 1984, and one of the first things we wanted to do was set up a, a quantitative class on population methods and sampling. And, uh, so it took us a while to get this thing through the system and also to get it around some of the other faculty at the time. But we ended up with FW663, Sampling and Analysis Methods for Vertebrate Populations. <clears throat> and it was an unheard of five semester graduate class. It was, we only taught it on even years, <clears throat> even numbered years. And it went from eight to 12, Monday to Friday. And we usually tried to teach it in about 10 weeks so that we could spend the last five weeks of the semester getting back to the real work. <clears throat> um, I know a lot of you in here I know have taken it, so you, you know I'm not telling you anything new. It was a really, um, killer course in the sense that a lot of work. We meet every morning at 8 o'clock, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, <clears throat> and question and answer. Of course, you got questions because they knew the quiz was coming, so the longer they could procrastinate the quiz, the, long, the better the questions. And then we'd have the quiz, <clears throat> and then we'd follow up with, go over the quiz, and then David would lecture, and that's, I used to be so intimidated by his ability to lecture because he, be working with somebody that was so good, and me to be so bad, just was, uh, anyway, I got over it. I kept doing it. <clears throat> the lecture, and then while he was lecturing, I would grade the quiz and hand them back. And his lectures are always so good. Students would come out of there thinking, I've got it. I understand it. I know what's going on. And that's just how good he was at presenting this stuff. And of course, when they got in the lab and started doing the computer exercises, reality hit the road, and, and it's like, oh, okay, maybe I don't quite understand this as much as I thought I did. But then again, that's the way you teach stuff, like these quantitative methods. You start digging into them, and pretty quick, you do have a good understanding. <clears throat> 
So we do the computer lab, and we always had one or two, quote, volunteers, that TAs, because they would run special stations on Tuesdays and Thursdays for the students that wanted help. And in addition, uh, <clears throat> there were usually our grad students or other grad students in the department that, that wanted to get a, a refresher. They had the course the previous two years, and they wanted to do some more on it. And then after that, David and I go to lunch, with, usually with the volunteers, the TAs, and we would prepare a quiz for the next time, which usually involved, first of all, kind of the general topics we wanted to cover, what things students didn't appear to be getting, and then uh, usually try to set up some very quantitative exercises, even for the quizzes, where the numbers were legitimate. They weren't just made up. <clears throat> so it was a, a lot of work, but it ultimately led to program mark. And the reason why was because um, in the class, we had about five or six or seven or eight different software packages that we used, and every one of them was different. All these things were evolving, so it started off with estimate and brownie for band recovery data and program capture, and then we got into program release, and we were using SURF and Surge and all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> and the students just spent way too much time worrying about the software and not getting the big picture. And, and this became really obvious because we'd asked students in their comprehensive exams after they'd had a class, had the class, well, what about this? Explain this a little bit. Well, they could tell you you need to put a one in column 79 to make estimate do something, but they couldn't tell you just exactly what it was, why it was doing it that way. <clears throat> so Ken had written a paper published in 91, I think, Ken, on how the encounter histories were really the critical part of the data, uh, or the this way to summarize the data. The, this concept of minimal sufficient statistics was kind of out the window at this point because of all these multi-models. Every model had different minimal sufficient statistics, and so the encounter histories are where the action was. <clears throat> and that provided an umbrella for a lot of different models. And so that's what led to program mark. And now, I started working on that in the 1994, there were some big issues about how to determine the number of parameters that were actually estimated, which is still a big issue, but it's sort of under control. Uh, but Windows 95 was coming out. I was working with Windows 3.0 and 3.1, which was a complete disaster, but I knew it had to get better because Windows 95 was there. So we first used Program Mark in the class <coughs> in the spring of, or, yeah, spring of 1996. And I was going around putting Windows 95 on students' computers so they could actually do the quiz or do the, the test and the exercises. Uh, <clears throat> but that's what led to program mark, was actually the class and some uh, stuff that Ken had published and the fact that we now had a, a decent user interface that we could start working with. And we had the computing power to do all these different models. <clears throat> so program mark led to many workshops, which is what I think I was technically assigned to talk about. Um, I think the first workshop that we did was in 1998 in St. Andrews on uh, program mark. And then we started doing our summer workshops every summer here in 1999. Um, and that went on for many years. I don't know how many, but a lot. And we had lots of others around the world. I know we... Uh, Noah David and I went to UAE in 2005, and I think we were in Perth, Australia in 2006, and I don't know, those are the ones I just happened to have been able to remember the dates on. <clears throat> but the key thing about these workshops <clears throat> is always an emphasis on the theory, and not just punching the buttons, you know. It, again, to Ken's comment, Ken Wilson's comment about the black box, you know, it isn't just a black box. Here's the methods that are going on under the hood. Here's the numerical optimization. You need to understand this. So the summer workshops in particular had a pretty rigorous format. And we usually tried to follow up when we were doing workshops outside of Fort Collins. But I had a workbook, a hard copy workbook, which grew over time because we kept getting them bigger and bigger. And then uh, back then it was a CD, but later on zip drives and <clears throat> uh, had all the exercises, lots of other software, uh, computer stuff. We always started off with a Sunday evening social so that students could get acquainted and get to know one another a little bit, uh, find out who had similar problems, and hopefully you might be able to work together. Uh, again, lectures followed by labs throughout. Uh, Thursday workshop dinners, 
were always a classic because at first we used to go to the Cottonwood Club out south of town here, and then we'd finish on Friday afternoon, Friday by noon or there at, thereafter. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the things that in these workshops that we featured was we always wanted to have a whiteboard. And this is a picture from UAE where we didn't have a whiteboard, and so we told them, well, God, you guys got to get a whiteboard because we don't want to write on that screen that's behind there because <clears throat> that's usually what was going to happen. And so they got this whiteboard. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of paper towels down below that are dirty, and you can see all kinds of cleaner. In fact, one of them has got one of those signs they put on trucks showing hazardous materials in, within it. Uh, we were having a heck of a time cleaning this screen off. Something was wrong. And I know we're scrubbing on this thing, and I just happened to notice that when you're moving it, the, the, the text was actually moving just a little bit. They brought us in a new whiteboard, and they hadn't taken the cellophane off of it, and we were writing on the cellophane. <laughs> uh, that was a classic. <clears throat> but the fact that we would project our computer screens on, onto that whiteboard and be able to, to teach was a really good way. The other point, again, were the lectures. <clears throat> David is such a great lecturer, you all know that. Um, you can see Evan Cooch in the very back corner of that slide in his usual position. And for those of you that have taken the workshop or the 663, you might recognize what's on that little computer screen, the clam exercise. That was one of David's favorites. Uh, we used to have this exercise that he dummied up and, uh, <clears throat> yeah. It was a long involved explanation and it was a good exercise, so. <clears throat> he was never much of one to get his hands on the keyboard. He sort of stand back and explain what was on the screen, but he wasn't gonna get in there and punch on that keyboard because that was not his forte. Usually when I wanted to test out a piece of software, I'd let him play with it and that was enough to show me that there's some broken, something's broken somewhere, but even when it wasn't broken, it looked like it was broken. <clears throat> um, Again, we had fun. Those Thursday evening dinners, um, usually that meant that Friday morning students are pretty hungover, and I became very good at figuring out when to close the open bar at the, at the Cottonwood Club because I found out early on that if you close it too soon, they all went downtown, and then they came back Friday morning really hungover. And if I closed it too late at the Cottonwood Club where they're gonna be really hungover. So there was just an optimal level in there where they'd had enough to drink to go home and go to bed rather than to go downtown, <clears throat> uh, myself included. <clears throat> uh, we had fun. Uh, again, those workshops, you can see Evan, and I'm not sure who that is in the background, but my suspicion it might be Mary Connor, but I can't quite tell. <clears throat> uh, one year, Evan brought Mark workshop t-shirts, program mark t-shirts. And so you can see all the helpers that we had at these workshops. Um, uh, again, they're all volunteers. They showed up just to have fun because <clears throat> it was fun, uh, especially if you weren't taking the class trying to learn mark. <laughs> uh, and then that led into the whole Northern Spotted Owl meta-analysis. It started, it actually started in 94, three, two, somewhere in there. I first got involved with it. I think he did one even before then. But uh, I'll mention it in a little bit. But a piece of software that actually eventually helped lead into Mark was developed because of the NSO meta-analyses. Uh, but these were uh, every, held every five years to reanalyze the uh, Northern Spotted Owl data. And you see Bob Anthony was one of the leaders there. You see Alan Franklin bending over my shoulder uh, looking at the computer screen. These started off, <clears throat> again, David had, a, had to organize these things, his leadership abilities coming through. Uh, we had a very rigid protocol for how people submitted data to be analyzed. We had a whole multiple days of deciding what models were gonna actually run. We had a lot of computer helpers that helped run the data with the people that actually collected it. <clears throat> so they were involved in it. And uh, they all, these resulted in multiple publications every five years on what advances had been made, what, in the case of what changes had been made in the owl survival rate, which is pretty easy because they just kept going down. <clears throat> uh, David was, again, lecturing. He 
probably like if you could look at that screen a little bit, you'll be able to see a callback Lieber equation up there, one of his favorites. Uh, so he, David, directly contributed in the sense of ideas and discussions to these software packages that I was responsible for over the years. The two surge program <clears throat> was written to, for one of the Northern Spotted Owl workshops held here in town in, sometime in the 90s, <clears throat> early 90s, I think, 94 maybe, uh, because we were using surge, the program that the French folks had written, but it was not public, or it's not ready for the masses to reuse. It was very difficult to use, and so I'd written this interface to it called two surge, which gave me a lot of ideas about how to write program mark, actually. <clears throat> So the other thing that Dave Otis didn't mention in his talk that was in the, the NERP report, the <clears throat> Los Alamos report on program capture, was history. We had pictures of people that had contributed. Dave was always good at recognizing people whose shoulders we were standing on when we were doing this work. And <clears throat> he always liked to go back and talk about his IBM punch cards because the one piece of software he wrote, program estimate, was all written on, a, on punch cards. And so... <clears throat> You like to go back and remind people of that. Um, now, the UAE workshop. Um, we usually try to go to, if you're doing a workshop overseas someplace, a couple hours or more time zone difference, well, you wanted to get there early. And I didn't understand fully the reason why we need to get to Abu Dhabi a couple, three days early, but I figured it out pretty quickly when we <coughs> hitched a ride up to Dubai to go to the Lamborghini dealership. <clears throat> and you can see he's, he's in his element here. Uh, there's that Lamborghini and he's just lusting over it. <clears throat> but what he really wanted was to go to the service department to get a part for his old Lamborghini. <laughs> and you can see him here, he's trying to describe it to this guy and the guy behind the, the counter, he, he could give a damn. And the guy looking at me, kind of that little glare like, you know, what the hell are you guys doing in here? You don't have the money to do anything like this. <laughs> And uh, what we discovered, uh, David is really disappointed, it, it, service in Lamborghinis in Dubai was you bought a new one. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't screw around with parts. <laughs> you just bought a new one. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, he got me into all kinds of trouble on that trip. We, he wanted to go into a mosque. So we took off our shoes and walked into a mosque, and it's like, David, we got to get out of here. <laughs> this is a mistake. Uh, anyway, all I can say is echo the same things that others have said, is that he definitely contributed to my career, his leadership and his mentorship <clears throat> uh, greatly improved my ability to do science, and uh, all I can say is thanks to him. <clears throat> Yeah, um, Dave's love for exotic cars. No, no one has mentioned, you know, in, in Utah, he had this sort of nice house south of town, and I remember being invited over for dinner, and it had a huge basement, big picture window, and you're out back barbecuing, and he takes you down to the basement, and there's his Jag. Winter in Utah, he would take this picture window, and he bought this house, just because it would work. Take the picture window out, put some uh, uh, runners down into the basement and drive that sucker down there, leave it there all winter, and then you'd see it out again next. And I'm like, this is my major advisor. <laughs> my God. Uh, um, it, it is interesting. I mean, he, he, he did love to uh, occasionally, as, as Gary said, he, you know, allude to his days of cards and the programming he did, but it was like, you know, he figured out early on, yeah, I'm done with that. 
let me go find someone who knows this new stuff because you would swear that he really didn't know what a computer was, but you know, he did. It was interesting to listen to Tamara talk about all the things he did um, with animals growing up, which I had no idea. Um, when Dave went in the field in Utah State, um, I don't think, I'm pretty sure I never mentioned it to him. If he, if he, he might have overheard it. The grad students, when they would see him, like when he went out, uh, uh, that project uh, Otis mentioned where they were doing these uh, remote sensing, trying to, uh, uh, they, they would put out uh, deer uh, uh, skins in snow, fly an airplane and try and estimate the population that way. Uh, they did similar, uh, one of his uh, uh, PhD, his, maybe it was his first PhD student, Jack Payne, um, was doing that with uh, mallards, which have an iridescence and ultraviolet light. But anyway, Dave would be going out in the field, and we called him Eddie Bauer, because he would be impeccable. He'd have this sort of safari tan jacket. He'd have blue jeans that were crisp, and they were blue, you know. And then he had these old hiking boots that looked like they had 40 layers of that wax you put on the old boots, and he'd be going out. And, and you'd see all the grad students would be like, oh my God. <laughs> he'd come back, if, muddy, snowy. There was nothing on any of those clothes. So, so he was quite good at that. <laughs>